Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the Texas Outlaw Running Talk Show. We have JP on today. He recently ran Bandera at 100K. He got second place. He got a ticket to Western States, which if you don't know, Western States is the Super Bowl of ultra running, trail and ultra running. And so it's a big deal. Before we start though, guys, we have a Patreon. If you want to support for $2 a month, or it might be even, it might be $3 a month. Um, it really helps the show out, especially when a lot of you are supporting. What this does, guys, it goes right back into the show. It allows Texas Outlaw Running Talk Show to continue to create content and create better content, get better equipment, and make better, um, I guess, yeah, content and value for people, um, bringing them into the sport, growing people in the sport, and making them better at trail and ultra running. And so, guys, this Patreon goes a long ways. Um, and we also do have a rating if you want to rate or subscribe to the show, if you like it, it's all yours. Go for it, guys. Um, I do want to warn you guys just real quick before this episode even starts. The beginning starts off, uh, it might, JP might sound a little weird, but we end up addressing it. And after about five or 10 minutes, it sounds better. So y'all don't worry about the audio. It gets better after the beginning, but that's enough rambling about that. Here is JP. JP, man. So you just got the golden ticket from or from Bandera for Western States, man. Tell me about yeah. it. Oh, I am super excited about it. I mean, I have been, this is the second golden ticket race I've done. Um, the first one I did was uh, Canyon's hundred K and that's kind of what last year started off my kind of belief in myself that I could kind of do this for, or, or at least try to enter the, the pro rank or be, you know, a, a name in the sport. And, um, I ended up finishing 13th there and have improved my running a lot. Um, been training a ton and coming up to this race. I had a lot of experience through Leadville and, and, you know, getting podiums in a lot of races throughout the year that I had this belief in myself that I could do something like this, get the golden ticket. And it was just an incredible day where everything, most things just clicked. And I ended up, you know, coming, coming away with second and the golden ticket. So it, it was a huge, awesome day. Yeah, man. Yeah, I I was there and I had seen you um at that first aid station. I can't remember the name of it, but mile five ish. Um mm-hmm. you're running Boils, yeah. Yeah, Boils. And it looked super stacked. You had all these elite runners flying through there. Yeah. Probably like twenty of them. Twenty guys just trying to get yeah. a golden ticket, man. And mm-hmm. it was just it was insane, man. And um a lot of people had some bad days, especially when that humidity came out. Uh, what, what kind of, uh, what made you have the good day that you had? Because a lot of people had some bad days out there. Yeah, so um, it was super fun. As you said, I, I came into the race, well, essentially an unknown. Like going into the race, I consumed all the media, all the, you know, pre-race favorites, all that stuff. And, you know, I thought that I would be kind of someone to look out for with the second place finish at Leadville, um, winning the Leadman series overall up at Leadville and having a, a couple of other podiums throughout the year. And so I thought that my name would be out there somewhere, but it never happened. So I was going in as kind of an underdog, but I did all the research on all, all the competitors out there. And yeah, like you said, through the first five, five and a half ish miles through boils, it was super stacked together. Um, nobody was really making a move. Everyone was kind of with each other. It was kind of slick. That was the most technical section of the course. And so it was pretty slick going down some of those descents and going up. Um, but it was super packed together. And, you know, all the who's who's were there. All the names were that were going for the golden ticket were there. and. I would say part of my success for the day was one, doing my research before 
looking who was there, kind of the strengths, weaknesses of them. Like, oh, this guy is a really good half marathon, but he's never ran over that distance. So, you know, I could feel kind of confident and like let him go a bit and because he's, he's never gone above that distance. Um, we had some really good, what I call like adventure runners or kind of what I did, like the survival races where you just have these extreme distances and you just need to be the one that slows down the least for them. Yeah. So we had those guys, we had um, some really fast hundred milers, 50 milers. So doing my research and kind of knowing who my competition was uh, a big deal. And then uh, I think the most important thing for the day is visualization. And so going into the race, and visualizing the whole day from waking up to getting to the race to the start, you know, what you might feel going to the aid stations, different mile markers, um, and then seeing how you want your day to end um, is huge. So the mental aspect and visualization as part of that is, I think, 99% if you want to be successful in ultra running is you have to have that mindset of wanting to do it, whatever you are, if you just want to finish it, or if you want to win these races or get these golden tickets, if you don't believe in yourself and have that visualization that goes through it, you know, the day's already lost. And so that was, that was, that was the biggest thing for me is visualization. And, you know, training was, kind of hard here in boulder uh, that's where i live um you know the snow is here it's freezing cold most mornings oh yeah and- uh-oh looks like we lost you let's see if we can get you back and run 10 miles before work um but you know the weather aspect of races doesn't really it doesn't bother me too much um, the weather's going to be what the weather's going to be, and everybody has to deal with those conditions. So um, if I'm sweating, hurting, uh, the humidity, the heat's getting to me, you know, I just adjust to it. And I know that everybody else is feeling the same thing. So, um, yeah, it's just don't let the uncontrollables get to you. You can't control the weather. You can't control what's going to happen out there. Don't let it be a huge burden to your mental psyche just take what comes and and deal with it as it comes yeah yeah and did that so did that heat bother you with you being in boulder and training in boulder did did that heat mess with you uh so the first lap without the sun kind of that overcast that was that was really nice i started to get really zapped on the second lap um when that sun came out and i kind of knew that I'm a heavy sweater, and when that same sun came out and the humidity rose, that was bacon, and there was some a really rough spot there, and I adjusted to it just knowing that um, pickle juice, salt, like just consume as much pickle juice or as much salt as you can at each aid station, because I just it's like a secret weapon, like caffeine. Like caffeine, caffeine, caffeine. Drink as much caffeine as you can. I think it's like one of the, it's like a, a legal PED that you can take is caffeine. Yeah. So I drink a ton of Coke at every aid station. I have um, caffeine in all my gels and then salt, salt, salt. So um, those are the biggest things with dealing with any sort of heat or energy depletion when that sun comes out is just consuming a ton of salt. And something you have to note is if you're peeing throughout the race, if it's been like a couple hours and you haven't had to run to the bathroom break, you are really dehydrated. So yeah. it's just, um, yeah. Hey, JP. So that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Really quick, um, you, you, your mic also sound, started to sound like a robot. I don't know how oh, to sorry. Fix that. We could probably do some singing right now and probably get a good song out through this. <laughs> How about now? Is that any better? Okay, that's awesome. Okay, that's awesome. perfect. Yeah. Sweet, okay. man. Cool. Um, anyways, continue with what you were saying, man. Yeah, the day, way that I deal with the heat is just consuming a ton of water, salt, 
um, pickle juice and, and caffeine and going to the aid stations and not being in such a rush. So um, one thing that kind of ended up biting me through the aid stations is I would run through having a crew is huge, but I, I didn't have any crew here. And so I just hand the bottles off to the aid station volunteers and they'd fill up with, I'd always have one water, one electrolyte, and I'd run through the aid stations and be trying to screw on my bottle caps <laughs> and I'd be running out and I switched them every time at the aid station. So they wouldn't screw on and I'd go be out of this aid station with full bottles. And by the time I'm a hundred yards out, I'm already down half a bottle. So <laughs> that's going to bite you in the butt yeah. when you need that full bottle for those really um, hot sections. Um, so taking your time and not being flustered through aid stations is a big thing also. So yeah. um, you want to be fast and efficient because that's time. Like uh, the biggest, one of the biggest things coming from kind of just participating in these ultras to wanting to race at the front is changing my mindset in the aid stations of thinking in seconds, not minutes. Mm. Um, so you want to have a plan before each aid station. So you're in and out of there, like a, like a NASCAR, like pit crew, like yeah. it, it needs to be, you know, below 30 seconds because that time adds up. And there's critical times in those aid stations where if you take too long, that front pack might go through or the person you're running with. And once they go, just that mental aspect of having to run by yourself um, can completely derail your race. So um, yeah, those are kind of, big things with dealing with heat humidity is uh, taking your time through the aid stations, not too long, but making sure you have what you need for, for success to the next aid station. Yeah. That's good. That's good advice, man. Um, yeah. I want to, I want to go back to the start, man. So yeah. where did this whole running thing start? Yeah. So I, I want to say it started in high school you know, I started when I was 18 years old. Um, I did triathlon. Um, I started my, my senior year of high school. My uncle did an Ironman and he told me about it. And I'm like, wow, that sounds like the coolest thing ever. I want to do it completely naive. <laughs> and so I signed up for my first Ironman when I was 17, going to turn 18 for it. No. Um, no endurance background at all. I was a wrestler did rugby, lacrosse. And so running was like the worst thing possible. And I'm like, well, I gotta, I gotta start doing something. And so being the naive 17 year old JP, I thought, well, you run a, a marathon in the Ironman. So I'm going to sign up for a marathon <laughs> and no training. I remember the next week there is this marathon that would run in front of our house in Denver, the, the Colfax marathon or the rock and roll marathon, something like that. I'm like I'll sign up for that. I did that. So I signed up for it. I went out, just ran a marathon, most painful thing I've ever done. I think I did it in three hours and 50 minutes or something oh, like that. Uh, and um, I just remember those last three miles. So painful, but the feeling of crossing the finish line after doing that. And just, it's just anyone that's done an endurance event like that or pushed their mind or body just understands that feeling of crossing a finish line of something that you did that was really, really hard. And I was hooked. And so I ended up um, doing um, triathlon uh, raced at CU Boulder for the collegiate triathlon team. Um, won four national championships, the team national championships with them. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got into it was triathlon. And then I got kind of burned out with triathlon. Um, what did you get tired of? Uh, it just, I stopped feeling a sense of accomplishments mm. at the end of these races. Um, I got tired swimming definitely sucks oh, yeah. um, and I was never going to be good enough. I didn't have the, I didn't like biking enough to be 
good at it. Like competitive cycling is it is and being good on a bike is a huge part of Ironman. I'd say if you aren't a good cyclist, no chance you're going to be good at triathlon. Um, I was a very good runner, uh, but I just didn't have the patience or energy to put time in to race a bike. Um, and so I just got discouraged. You know, I got tired of some of the people in the sport. It's just, um, yeah, I just got burned out, I'd say. And I found ultra running because of that burnout. Um, I was trying to qualify for Kona. Um, and I got really close a couple times and I just thought, okay, I need to take a break from this. I'm not having fun with this anymore. And so I learned about the level 100 and I'm like, okay, all that, this trail run thing seems hard and cool. So I'll do that. Um, so I signed up for the lead man challenge, um, that summer when I was 20 or 21, what what is and, the man challenge? What is that? Yeah, so it's a a series of races over uh um the course of the summer. Yeah. It starts with the Leadville Marathon uh early summer and then ends with the Leadville 100 at the wow. end. Yeah. And so the progress of it is the Leadville Marathon, then you go to the Le- uh, Leadville 50 mile run and 50 mile bike, and then you do the Leadville 100 mountain bike the week before the hundred run. And then you do the Leadville 10 K run after the mountain bike. And then next week you do the Leadville 100 run. Wow. And so that's the lead challenge. Um, it goes over the course of, I want to say June to end of August. And so, um, that's kind of where I fell in love with, uh, the sport. Um, I got my first exposure to it training for the Leadville doing a 50 K. Um, once again, no experience trail running, just went out, did a 50K, super hard. Like, oh my God, you're running up mountains, down mountains, you're in nature, um, cross the finish line. And just the people and just the vibe and the experience afterwards was really what drew me to the sport. Like, it was a, a pretty sweet experience and just this sense of accomplishment from um, these ultra runs is yeah. pretty huge compared to something that I got from triathlon. So, oh, yeah, yeah how, that's, how, that's... Would, how would you describe that vibe, man? Because, um, you know, people listening that might not have been yeah. at a big trail running event like that. How do you describe it? Yeah. Um, from, from first place to last place, everyone's out there doing something really difficult. And at the end of the day, you have that sense of accomplishment from first place to last place that everyone covered that course. Some in different times, but everyone had their own struggles and their own um, mental lows, mental highs out there. Um, And so at the end of the day, I remember at my 50 cam, I get done. I'm just like, Oh my God, that was so hard. I'm, I'm sitting down at the river and I'm just soaking my legs and this shirtless long haired bearded guy comes down and he comes up to me and he's like hey man do you mind if i take a seat next to him like yeah sure and it was anton krapishka (laughs) sits next to me and he's like man that was pretty that was pretty hard out there wasn't i'm like oh my god (laughs) like yeah and so like in what other sport do you just have one of the top level elite runners just come and just chit chatting with you down by the river you know eating some post-race meal, just having a drink and just relaxing and just talking about the day. Um, it's super low key, very chill. Yeah. It's just like, a, yeah, it's a, it's a big, big party pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. One girl that when I was at Bandera, we were talking about how when Courtney DeWalter walked out, everyone started flooding, trying to get pictures. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about how, ultra and trail running is it kind of one of the only sports to where you can get that up and close and personal with a yeah. professional athlete yeah. yeah um but with that did you ever while out at bandera did you ever share any miles with courtney or did you ever or were you in front of her the whole time no yeah we were in front that lead pack was in front of her the whole time i kind of joke now that my a my A goal of the race was not to give you Courtney. <laughs> that was my A goal. Oh, yeah. 
the goal accomplished and anything after that <laughs> it's going to be good but awesome. uh yeah i i um uh, i ran into her a couple times out here because she lives in boulder and yeah. i did um uh i did the lead challenge again and she lives up in leadville so i went back and did the lead challenge again uh and to win it and i ended up winning the lead challenge this year um and i'd be i remember on the 50 mile run i'm grinding i'm leading the race so far and i just hear this raspy voice just like keep going good job you got it and i look up and it's just courtney running down and i'm just fanboying i'm just like oh my god it's Courtney! like my posture gets up i like crush i'm like crushing up the hill now and i'm like oh hey courtney i'm great and she goes by and i'm just like oh my god <laughs> it's just courtney but yeah it's cool like just being able to see um your idols or people that really inspire you to do well out there um racing the same course i mean racing bandera looking around i'm like wow these guys all have some very impressive resumes and they are all really inspiring people in the sport and like i want to be here and and try to be one of these guys that can inspire um people to get out and do some really hard things like um that is kind of the main goal and the main drive um, from personal satisfaction. I really get a lot of joy from people that are like, man, like what you did that inspired me to go out and run uh, even a mile or that inspired me to sign up for my first trail race. And I think it just makes you a better human to just put yourself out there and do really hard stuff. And I mean, it can be any distance, but once you like, once I've done a hundred miles, life is easy. Like it, nothing can be that hard. <laughs> like you just yeah. get a whole different perspective on so many things. Once you do these ultras or any really athletic event where you push yourself. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, it was really cool to me to see somebody like you get the golden ticket because you were somebody that like you said people weren't expecting yeah and i love those types of people man the people yeah. the person that no one ever expected man because they got a story and drive you know like unlike anybody else you know mm -hmm. and so that's why i was excited to even have you on man for you to share yeah. this story and help inspire people out there to be better you know yeah and dude yeah i mean mindset's the whole thing i, I went in Honestly, it was a little bit of a chip on my shoulder just being like, well, if, if nobody knows who I am, I'll just go out there and, and kind of prove to my prove to myself. I definitely had a bit of imposter syndrome, like yeah. going in for, like, I don't know what it is about the Leadville 100 that it's probably because it's overshadowed by UTMB, but it's a really hard race <laughs> and it may not be a super deep um, competitive, like professional field. But there are some really talented athletes that go out there and prove uh, what they can do and go on to have a lot of success in um, the ultra running world. Like what Adrian McDonald did to win Leadville that year, just crushing it, at running the third fastest time, I think, at 1608. He was on a whole nother level that day. Like it, yeah. it was a battle for second place, second and third after we saw Adrian go off. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. I had a bit of imposter syndrome, like going into this race thinking, you know, I, I, I what I would think had some semi impressive results over the course of my short, I haven't even been doing this for a year. Um, uh, I started my, my kind of, what I consider my competitive ultra running in canyons, hundred K this past year. And I was like, Oh, am I like doing something wrong? Like, am I just, are these really nothing to, 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 are these results not good enough um, to be noticed? And so I went in there just wanting to prove to myself and others that no, man, you, you belong here. Like you put in the work, you have that mentality. Um, you want to go out and inspire others to, to do things like this. So just go do it. And uh, yeah. yeah, that's what happened. So why did you choose Bandera? And I, I mean, there's all these other golden ticket races. Why was it Bandera? 
So um, I was on the wait list for a bit. Um, I did McDowell Mountain Frenzy um, and ended up getting third place in that. Just didn't have the best day that I wanted. Just made some nutritional mistakes on uh, on the course. Um, here's a lesson. Don't eat four dried dates at an aid station early in the race because you will be feeling bad <laughs> later on. That will clear out any system. <laughs> yeah. And so I made that mistake and had a bit of a rough patch in there, but I didn't want to end like the season with that. Um, and so I, I got off the wait list for Bandera um, and thought, man, this is, this is cool. This is a golden ticket. Like, let's go for it. And it's going to be super competitive. And I just want to run with the best in the sport. And so that's why I ended up going out for it. I'm also signed up for Black Canyons, 100K. Uh, body's recovering well. Uh, the worst part is the feet and the toenails. They just, they just need to come out. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm planning on going out to Black Canyons also. Um, to, to race that because yeah, it's still, I don't know. It's just kind of like a bit of imposter syndrome still where I just really want to run with the best and just kind of prove to myself that I, I, I can do something like this. Yeah. So what's the time between Bandera and you said black Canyon, right? What's black the Canyon. time between those? Yeah. So black Canyons is February 18th. So it's a little over a month away. Okay. Um, and I found like the, the more I've been doing this since I've been doing kind of ultra endurance events for the past 10 years, my body has, is pretty good at recovering. Um, I knock on wood, have never really had any issues with overuse injuries, um, anything like that. I take very good care of my body, eat well, sleep a ton, um, rest when I can and a lot of my training is at pretty, not super high intensity, um, but there's like, you know, two or three hard sessions a week and the rest is super easy, super chill. And I think running on trail, um, you're able to, to do more just because the impact on the body is a lot less than road running. So yeah, yeah uh, right now the plan is to go down to, to Black Canyons and, and race again. Um, and, you know, I just really love that environment and just the whole process, the whole race day, seeing people. Um, it's just like a feeling unlike any other. It's like chasing one high to the next. It's kind of, it's kind of like the endless summer of, of surfing. It's just cause our year is, you can go to any race throughout the whole year. The trick is to um, uh, not do too much, but some people would probably say I am, but hey, it's what I love. So <laughs> yeah. until I learn the hard way, I guess, <laughs> this is what I'm going to be doing. Oh, yeah, man. So um, can you kind of walk us through like uh, your strategy of the race, man, Bandera? Yeah. Like where did you start out? out? Uh, did yeah. you go out with that fast pack? Did you kind of hold your pace? What did that look like? Yeah. So I – the day – any race I do, especially this one, I make it a point to stay with that lead pack. Yep. Um, I don't really get caught up in oh, course records or, you know, a lot of the talk was, will he negative split the second lap or, um, you know, they'll go in to this aid station at this time or this time. I didn't even have a watch on that whole time. My watch died before the race. And so I was running without a watch, nothing. <laughs> I had to run to my car, get my phone to start Strava, just in case I wanted something to record and just to see where I was on the course. So I was running on field that whole time. And I'm out there to race, and whatever the lead pack is doing, I'm going with it. So like I said, I did my research before. And, you know, during the race – we were all super bunched up um, yeah. for a good while. I want to say it wasn't until the third A station where like something clicked and it became race mode. So we were all chit chatting, you know, goofing off, laughing, um, catching up. 
and just no one was making any big moves or had any intent to. And then there was something after, I think it was Nacho's aid station where it just got quiet mm. and like people like got in, uh, you know, race mode, like it's time to go. And um, after that, I made a move and ended up running into second place um, with Canyon Woodward right in front doing a really strong, like setting the pace out really strong at first and um, ended up catching him um, going into Yaya before the uh, 50K loop. Um, we went in together for the 50K and then ended up passing him a little bit after uh, that mark out of the 50K first loop to gain first. And then I'm like, all right, here we go. You're in first place. Like, and you can kind of see once you go out of that first loop, it's a little out and back. So you can see like people coming in as you're going out. And as they were coming in, you know, it was Brian Curl, Jeff Colt, uh, McConaughey. Um, who else was there? Uh, pretty much all the names that were um, Anthony Lee, all the names that were slated for the golden ticket were there and we were all very close chris myers yeah and like it's a it's a race like <laughs> here we go and i was feeling really strong really confident and was running in first up until um let's say i believe equestrian i came in first and jeff colt was um a couple seconds behind me i believe watching some some uh footage afterwards he came in about a minute after me and that's when that was a really hard section that's when the uh, sun came out and i thought from equestrian to nachos was the hardest part of the course um, it was kind of the most technical climbing and descending and i heard footsteps behind me and i didn't even need to look back to know that it was <laughs> jeff coming off and he comes up he's like hey jp is like good to meet you and I'm, i was like suffering i was just like jeff it'd be, it'd be good to meet you in any situation but this <laughs> and he was he was like come on let's uh he gave me some good intel he's like they're three minutes behind let's work together and we can secure these golden tickets so this like, was this was about 45 miles in the race right probably yeah probably something like that maybe even like yeah, 40, I would say around 40 miles into the race, 40 to 45 miles. And um, okay. like there is, there's moments in these races where you either are like, no, I, I, I'm just going to have a pity party and give up or like you go like, yeah. and I knew that if he passes me and I let him go, I'm just, it's just, I might just like the mental aspect might be gone. Like you might break there. And I thought, man, he's here with me. He says, let's go. And so we ran together for that section and it was super helpful to have him like ha running with someone of that caliber was super rewarding. And we were just silent, just, just grinding it out. And, um, yeah, I was really grateful that he was the one to catch me. And I think, the announcer said, looking back on it, that we actually negative split that section from the first, first time. Wow. So we went faster that second time and um, yeah, running with him was huge. Um, we went into Nacho's aid station and he had uh, his dad race day, Rick there for a quick aid station. But I went in, you know, had, was kind of fumbling around and he was in and out. Um, so I wish I had a crew there to, you know, have some stuff there for me so I could go with them. Cause I think I could have ran with him for a good bit. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's just, it's just that importance of the aid stations. Um, when you're racing, the fact that he ran off, I could kind of see him in sight, but he was far enough gone that, you know, that pace starts to drag and, um, you stop chasing him. You're like, now you're looking over your shoulder for the person behind you. Yeah. Um, and then I sat in second place uh, for the rest of the race. Um, I knew that once I made it to the flatter sections of the course, I had a really good 
um, leg speed, doing a lot of flat work here in Boulder, which is something I think ultra runners overlook um, is not doing enough leg turnover for those flat sections because a lot of the time you can make a lot of a lot of time up in these races if you can um, run fast on flatter sections unless you live down south in texas then it's pretty uh it's pretty normal <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so, the mountains. yeah <laughs> true okay yeah i guess i guess it's easy to say here in boulder when i'm looking out my window and there's the flat tires <laughs> right there and oh, yeah. yes yeah but after that i just cruise second the whole time i got to the last aid station yaya yeah, yeah. and that's when it really clicked i'm just like you are not losing this second place now i had no intel on how far back third place was i just knew that there were some fast people that could close and so i just laid the hammer down for those last five miles and yeah i i did not say anything in my head I'm like you got i did not like Nothing was over until you crossed that finish line. And so until I saw those Hoka arches, I was like, no celebrating until you cross that line. And yeah. so once I saw those arches and I did a quick look over, I'm just like, you got this, man. And it was such a good feeling to come across that line and to have Jeff there, just a big hug afterwards. And it's just like, man, we, we did it. Like that was huge. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, that's, Dude, I bet your adrenaline levels were just going crazy in that moment, man. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, my friend Nikki, which is actually going to be the thumbnail of this video, he got a picture of you. I think you're like biting down on the ticket. What's up with that? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do a little kiss on it, yeah. Oh, you're doing a kiss? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> probably biting and chasing if it's gold too. I don't know, man. It's all, <laughs> it all blends into one. It was truly probably – you know, getting second and level and winning lead challenge was huge. Like this just raised the bar because it's so special. I just know how many people go for these every year and how, how many people have gone their careers trying to get one of these tickets. Yeah. And, you know, I was, you know, I, I was able to get one and it, it, and I'm able to go to the Western States. I, I, I would say to all my friends like that would ask, they would ask you, you'd ever want to do Western States? I'm like, yeah, what ultra runner doesn't want to do Western States? And I, I would tell them, but man, the only way that I would want to do it is to get in through a golden ticket. Um, I've never put in for the lottery, never, never done anything like that. And like to have that goal realized it's, it's pretty huge. And, um, I gotta say, uh, the imposter syndrome is starting to go down quite a bit and uh yeah it's uh it is definitely a, a check mark and so i'm really excited for western states and, and to see what i could do there yeah yeah man i'm excited to see what you do too so i mean you got the mountains to kind of train you for it and get you ready so yeah yeah, yeah. it'll be exciting for you to be up there competing with the rest of the top of the top in the world that's what, so. I, that's what i dream for that is what what i strive for every day yeah mm -hmm. Well, man, I'm excited for your journey. Um, yeah. I appreciate you sharing your story of Bandera. I put on Instagram, I asked if anyone had any questions for you. Okay, and my yeah. buddy who I was actually pacing at Bandera, mm -hmm. his name's Ryan, he had, uh, he had some questions. So he was asking, he said, what did you do in training leading up to Bandera that helped prepare you the most? Mm -hmm. And then he asked, what's your favorite type of run? Okay. Yeah. So, um, one thing that I think, um, a lot of ultra runners don't do is, uh, speed work or faster miles. So, um, <clears throat> whether it be on trail or flatland, I prefer doing flatland is I do a lot of my runs, um, out by the Boulder res on kind of more farm rows, farm dirt rows, kind of rolly, but, faster, like six minute miles, uh, six to six, 30 minute miles and work on that leg turnover. So I think getting that leg turnover and that stride is really big. Um, also downhill running is big. You can make a lot of time into a lot of athletes with downhill running. Um, my favorite, uh, workouts are just, uh, just absolute suffer fest up mountains. So 
I, I have a couple of like really good, just uh, gradual trails up, you know, Lion's Lair and Mount Sanitas or up the backside of Bear Peak here in Boulder. And um, just like a hard 45 minutes to an hour effort of just going. And that's, that's probably my favorite. Otherwise, um, easy, just casual miles, um, getting out with your friends, those are the big, make it as enjoyable as possible. You know, whatever gets you out the door is, is the number one thing. Oh yeah, absolutely, man. And I'll tell you the, the fastest I ever got was running up a bunch of mountains in Arkansas, um, Mm -hmm. up there in the Ozark mountains, man. And, and for someone who kind of grew up in kind of a flatland area, you know, DFW, Dallas, Fort Worth area. Yeah. Mountains, man. They made me such a faster and stronger runner. Yeah. yeah, I think that plays such a huge role because you look at the top 10 in Bandera, they're all from Colorado or some type of place with mountains. Yeah, yeah. That's just so important. So It is. Yeah, you, ha- you, have, to, you have to practice on the terrain that you're running in. Um, so, I mean, yeah, whatever you have to do to find those trails or those mountains or those hills, yeah, it's it's – hard to get around and i'm very lucky to be able to live here in boulder but it's it's a big part of it yeah man and hey i wanted to know so outside of running what yeah. do you do um what kind of what do you do for a living yeah so i work at rei just uh retail at rei um so part of my success i think also comes from you know being running in the morning you know 10 15 miles and then having to be on my feet all day for eight hours. Mm. So um, it really sucked at first, but um, having that time on feet, like I'm walking, you know, seven to eight miles a day at work, also doing 10 miles in the morning. So it's like 18 mile days back to back to back to back. And so, um, you know, it's retail, it's not the most affirming (laughs) life uh, path, but the people are great. they're really, uh, they really help out with, uh, scheduling. Um, so it's, it's a great place to work right now as I'm getting, uh, my feet under me for a uh, run in. And other than that, I love, uh, books. I got my degree in English literature and philosophy at, at Boulder, love reading, love movies. Um, yeah, that's kind of my life outside of running. Cool, man. Um, what do you, so at Boulder, were you just a student or were you involved in, in something there? Yeah, I was a student uh, mainly. And then uh, the, the collegiate, uh, the club team for triathlon there is kind of my social, my, was my social club. And so um, those were the two things that took up the most time at, uh, at Boulder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They got a good cross country team too. So yeah, yeah. Really good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, sweet, man. Um, well, I really appreciate it. Uh, you coming on and before we even ended or anything, what advice do you have for anyone listening or some wisdom? What do you have for him? It could be anything. Um, you know, my biggest thing is, uh, you know, be, studying philosophy in uh, school. I was a big fan of, of Stoics and their mindset and a lot of things. And the number one thing that I kind of bring to every day is don't get worked out, worked up about the uncontrollables, like focus on what you can do in any situation and that's all you can control. And then that's the biggest thing in life in running for me, it's just having that discipline and that um, mentality of eh, just, eh, it happened what are you going to do about it type of thing? It's just like, just, just uh, take care of things as, as they come. So a lot of stoic uh, principles, philosophy, and uh, uh, surround yourself with good people that really believe in you and uh, support you um, in what you do. So those are big things. Yeah, man. Hey, I will tell you in high school, I did debate and I got really into philosophy because the type of debate we used philosophy as our foundation. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you this, studying and learning philosophy, once you're able to kind of understand it and things start to click, yeah, almost like your mind opens. 
you start really, to really understand does. so much more in life. Yeah. Did, yeah. Would you say that happened to you too? Oh yeah. I, 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 it's just, it opens your mind up to everything. I mean, you aren't just, it's, it's like the blinders lift and you can rationalize or, or logically look through things, um, draw on different philosophies. Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's humbling. Like we're all just trying to get through this life <laughs> thing and none of us really know to a hundred percent extent what we're doing. And we're all just trying to get through it and work these hard things out. And uh, yeah, just like learning philosophy, just, just be good to each other. <laughs> like it's the main thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if, if people just are more understanding and good to each other and just un knowing that we're all just trying to get through this crazy thing of life that like, it's just, it's, it's so rewarding. Oh yeah. 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 And I, I would even say ultra running is philosophical within itself. Yes. Yeah. I would, I would say so also. Yeah. Very humbling. It's a very, very humbling experience. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It really is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it just makes you question a lot of things. Yes. And you have a lot of time to think out there. <laughs> so I am doing a lot of thinking, oh, yeah. a lot of self-reflection and thinking for sure. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, man. Cool. Well, I'm excited to see what you do in the mm -hmm. future. Um, you had some really great things to say, man. And people are, are going to have their eyes on you and they're going to be yeah. watching, man. Super. So, um, dude, just keep, keep doing it. You're inspiring. So. Thanks. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on and giving me uh, this platform to kind of uh, get out there. And uh, yeah, appreciate it. All right, y'all. That was JP Goblin. If you enjoyed the show, leave a rating, uh, whatever you're listening to. If you scroll down, there should be some stars on our podcast. Leave a rating, y'all, if y'all enjoyed it. If you're on to YouTube, give us a like, subscribe. Yeah, that's right. All you listening on podcast, Spotify, you could have watched it on YouTube. You still can. It's all on YouTube visually. It's on everything. Um, I just really appreciate all you who do tune in into these episodes because it shows that uh, you guys care about you know the trail and ultra running community and they are engaged with it. And that's just, it's awesome to see. It really is. And I love all of you. Um, if you want to support the show, we got our Patreon. It's a couple dollars a month. If you want to support and just help out, that is there. But this is the Texas Outlaw Running Talk Show. We do these once a month on Saturdays. And we have a shoot in the bull episode every Monday. And so if you guys want to tune in, if you want something to listen to while you run, and if you live in Texas or around Texas, you know somebody that's on the show, this is something to listen to for you. And um, But I think that's enough of that. And... You guys have a wonderful rest of your day, or if it's nighttime and you're listening, you have a good rest of your night, and we'll see y'all on next episode, so make sure to tune in.